Welcome back to our lecture series, Math 4220, Abstract Algebra 1 for students at Southern Utah University. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldein. In lecture 29 here, we're actually going to talk about one, uh, surprisingly, one of my favorite subjects in group theory, um, the idea of the Frobenius product, that is, the product of sets. Uh, and so let me kind of explain what I mean by that. So we have been talking in this series mostly about groups so far, right? And because it's a group, we have some operation, which we'll call it multiplication, on elements inside of that group. So if we have elements G and H inside of G, we know that G times H will be an element in G, of G. And this binary operation of elements will be associative with identity, with inverses, in the abelian case, it's commutative. We can talk about these talk about these properties of the binary operation on the elements of the set. What we want to do today in this lecture is kind of broaden the broaden the base a little bit. That in addition to multiplication of elements, we also want to talk about the multiplication of sets uh, inside of a group. So take two subsets H and K inside of G. Now these are genuine subsets. Uh, I make no statement that these are cosets or subgroups or there's not necessarily any structure to these sets. These are just subsets of G. So these are collections of elements of things who belong. Uh, these sets belong inside of a group. That's all we're assuming right now. And so then we can define the product of the subsets H and K here in the following way. We define a new set. So be aware here that if we take a set H and we combined it with this set K, we're going to produce some new set HK, which will be a subset of G, right? And so what exactly does that element look like here? The set HK will look like the all the possible products of little h times little k, where little h is an arbitrary element of capital H, and little k is an arbitrary element of capital K. That is, we look for every possible combination of products between the elements of H and the elements of K. And now this right here will naturally be a subset of G. Like I was saying earlier, since H is in, is in G, since H is a subset, and since K is a element of G, then their product will be in G because we're in a group. So this set makes sense. It's, it's, it's a subset of G. Um, and so we want to talk about these type of products of sets. Uh, this is often referred to in the literature as the Frobenius product of sets, if you want to try to like look it up on Wikipedia or something. Um, and I want you to be aware that in the in our previous discussions about cosets, this is actually a special case of what we're talking about right now, that when you talk about the coset GH, that's the left coset, well, GH is really just multiplying the singleton G by the set H, which happens to be a subgroup. And so what we're trying to do is broaden the base that in addition to products of elements and in addition to cosets, which are, again, very important subsets of a group here, we can talk about general products. And so we can talk about the product of two cosets and things like that. Now, some things that become immediately clear when we talk about uh, multiplying sets together is that as the multiplication of sets is defined element wise in G, this multiplication will likewise be associative. So if we have say like three sets, you have like H, K, and L, it doesn't matter how we do the parentheses, it'll automatically be associative, this Frobenius product, because element wise it is H, K, little l here is the same thing as H, K, little l, right? Because it's associated element-wise, it'll inherit this associativity on the sets. Same thing, that if, if of course, the group is, like, say, abelian, then multiplication will be element-wise commutative. That'll also imply that subset-wise, it'll be a commutative operation as well. Now, what we, of course, can see, and we'll see some examples of this, is that the sets could potentially commute even though individual elements not, might not commute. We'll, we'll see that in a little bit. So let's take as some examples here. Let's take the dihedral group D4, and let's take two, subs, two subsets. We're going to take the cyclic subgroup generated by S, the reflection across the x-axis, and we're going to take the cyclic subgroup generated by RS, where R, of course, is a 90-degree rotation there. When it comes to this Frobenius product, the subsets do not have to be subgroups. 
although those are subsets of particular importance. So if we want to compute the set HK, what that means is we're going to take the product of the set H, which as a subgroup, it's just one and S, and we're going to take the product uh, with the set K, which again, as a subset, this is actually a subgroup. So it's going to be one and RS. So we look at all the possible combinations here. So it's kind of like we foil this out a little bit. We have to take the product of the identity first. We take the identity in RS outside. We take the product of S and one inside, and then we take the product of S and RS last. So again, it's kind of like the FOIL method right here. You're going to get one times one. You're going to get one times RS. You're going to get S times one, and you're going to take S times RS. Now you have to be very careful in the order here because D4 is a non-abelian group. The order of multiplication does matter. Now with the identity, it doesn't make much of a difference. One times one, of course, is one. Uh, one times anything is just that, that, that thing right there. One times RS is RS. S times one is S. And then you're going to see that S times RS, when you get there, remember when it comes to the dihedral group, if you need a if you need to commute a rotation with the reflection S, you take the inverse of R. So you're gonna end up with right here, you're gonna end up with R inverse S squared. Now as we're in D4, uh, R inverse is actually the same thing as R3. So we're gonna put that in normal form right there and S squared is the identity. So, so H times K is equal to one RS, S and R cubed, okay? On the other hand, if you take I'll do a different color on this one. If you take KH, you reverse the order of these things. So we're going to take one RS and then times that by one S. Well, again, looking at all the possible combinations, you get one times one, you get one times S, you get RS times one, and then you're going to get RS times S for which one times one is the identity, one times S is S, RS times S is RS. So, so far, you know, these are the same thing in a different order, but the order of a set doesn't actually matter here. The final element though, of course, you're gonna get RS squared, which is just an R in that situation. So notice that these two sets are not equal to each other. Uh, HK is not equal to KH which isn't too surprising, right? Because the multiplication of elements is non-commutative, multiplication of sets might also be non-commutative, right? It doesn't commute because the elements didn't commute. Notice how S, R, S is not the same thing as R, S times S. And so that gave us a different product of sets there. Uh, it should also be mentioned that even if H and K, uh, in this case, are subgroups, the subset H, K is not necessarily a subgroup, right? I mean, if you look at this right here, this isn't a subgroup. For example, R doesn't have its inverse, which is R cubed. Uh, on the other hand, this one right here is missing its inverse, which is R. So that is, that's a realistic possibility. The product of two subgroups is not necessarily a subgroup, but all we're saying right now is the product of sets is gonna be a set inside of the group. Uh, let's do another example. Let's look at the quaternion group right here on eight elements. Uh, let's take the set I, J, K, and let's take the, the, we'll call that H, and we'll also take the set of their inverses, negative i, negative j, negative k. Notice these are not subgroups. Um, they're just, they're just, you know, they're just, uh, they're just subsets. Um, if we take their product, what we want is we want the product of i, j, and k with negative i, negative j, and negative k, like so. Looking at the possible combinations, you're going to get i times negative i, which is one. Uh, you're going to get i times negative j, which is a negative k. Uh, you're going to get I times negative K, which is a J. Next, you're going to get J times negative I, which is a K. You're going to get, uh, let's see, J times negative J, which is one. Uh, you're going to get J times negative K, which is a negative I. And then lastly, you're going to get K times negative I, which is a negative J. You're going to get K times negative J, which is an I, and you're going to get negative K, K times negative K, which is equal to one, right? And so then rewriting this thing, I mean, you'll notice that the, the identity showed up three times, which as this is a subset, the multiplicity doesn't really matter, right? Um, so we just list, we're just going to list it once. Um, then when you look at everyone else, you'll see you end up with an I and a negative I, you end up with a J and a negative J, and then you end up with a K and a negative K. Uh, negative one doesn't show up anywhere. Um, so we end up with plus or minus I, plus or minus J, plus or minus K. This right here is just the quaternion group 
take away negative one. That's the only thing that's missing in this consideration right here. Um, I want you to convince yourself that if we go the other way around, if we take, if we take kh, right? So now you're going to get negative i, negative j, negative k, and you times that by i, j, and k. You end up with all of these same elements, right? Let's convince ourselves of that. You're going to get negative i times i, which is 1. Negative i times j is negative k. Negative i times k is positive j. You're going to get negative j times i, which is a k. You're going to get negative j times j, which is a 1. And you're going to get a negative j times a k, which is a negative i. And then lastly, you get negative k times i, which is a negative j. You're going to get negative k times j, which is a positive i. And then a negative k times k is a 1. Right, And so you'll notice when you compare these things, right? well, the identity showed up three times again, which admittedly, you know, for, for the set, the multiplicity doesn't matter, so we get the identity. Um, and then let's see, we have an i and a negative i. They showed up each one time. You get a j and a negative j. They showed up each one time as well. And then you get k and negative k right there. And so everyone showed up except for negative 1 again. So in particular, we see that kh is equal to hk. So in this example, it's even possible that a product of subsets uh, could be, that even in a non-abelian group, right, it's still possible that the product of two subsets can commute. So h and k actually equals kh. The sets commute even though uh, the the elements didn't. That, that's an important thing to realize when we talk about this Frobenius product. Let's do one more example here. Uh, let's look inside of the symmetric group S3, and let's take the subgroups H equals 1, 1, 2, 3, 1, 3, 2. Uh, that's the cyclic subgroup generated by, of course, uh, 1, 2, 3. Uh, it also so happens to be the alternating group A3, right? We don't need that observation, though. And then K here is going to be the set 1 and then 1, 2. Uh, this, likewise, is a subgroup. It's the cyclic subgroup generated by 1, 2. So we have a cyclic subgroup uh, Z3 and a cyclic subgroup Z2 in play right now. Okay, so let's consider their product. Let's take H times K right here. So if you look at all the possible products, 1, 1, 2, 3, uh, 1, 3, 2, we times that by 1 and 1, 2. Okay, so in this situation, if you distribute, of course, the 1, that's pretty easy. You get the 1 times 1, which is the identity, 1 times 1, 2, which will be 1, 2. Next, you're going to go 1, 2, 3 times the identity, which is 1, 2, 3, all right? Uh, this one takes a little bit more effort, right? So think about this one right here. We have 1, 2, 3 times 1, 2, right? So 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3. So we see that 1 goes to 3. Uh, now we're going to see that 3 goes to 1. So we're going we're gonna to bring that thing off. And then as this is a permutation, 2 would have to go to 2. So that's going to be that element right there. Uh, then the next one, we're going to take 1, 2, 3 times the identity. Uh, what I say? 1, 3, 2 times the identity. And then the last one, we have to take 1, 3, 2 times 1, 2. And you see what happens here is 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 1, so 1's fixed, okay? Uh, 2 goes to 1, uh, what did I say there? So 1 goes to 2, uh, 2 goes to 1, so 1 is fixed, right? 2 goes to 1, 1 goes to 3. And so what we see here is the last element is going to be 2, 3. You'll notice that, hey, we actually got every single element of the group. Um, in this situation, it's even possible that the product of subgroups can, in fact, equal every element of the group, right? You get the whole group when you multiply these two sets together. And what you're going to see is if I go the other direction, that these two sets, in fact, commute, even though it doesn't happen element-wise. And again, we're going to get the whole group. Let's convince ourselves of this. So you get 1 times the identity, 1 times 1. That's a 1. You're going to get 1 times, uh, that's a 1, 2, 3 there. What did I write down? Try that again. 1, 2, 3, and 1, 3, 2. Uh, when you take 1 times this, you'll get, of course, the permutation 1, 2, 3. And then likewise, when you take 1 times the last element, you end up with 1, 3, 2. That's pretty easy. 
Uh, if you take one, two times the identity, you'll get one, two. And then so we have to do one, two times one, two, three, right? What happens here? Notice one goes to two, two goes to one. So one is fixed. You're going to see that two goes to three and then three will go to two as well. So we end up with two, three. And then the last possible product, one, two times one, three, two, you'll see one goes to three. And then three goes to two, but two goes to one. So three goes back to one. And so two has to be fixed as we only have three elements. And so, yeah, we got the whole group again. Uh, these two sets, these two subgroups, in fact, commute with each other. And so this gives you a variety of the type of products one gets when you start multiplying various sets together. And I hope this gives you a good feel that uh, even in a non-abelian setting, the sets can commute, even though it doesn't commute element-wise. Um, subgroups can actually multiply together to give you the whole group. And uh, we'll see some other interesting things coming up in the next video.